Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 256 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the FX series Taboo, a gritty historical drama starring Tom Hardy. And this will involve spoilers for the entire first season, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Carrie Vaughn, who you may remember from our feature interview back in Episode 9, our panel on Big Hero 6 vs. Interstellar back in Episode 127, and our panel on Mad Max Fury Road back in Episode 152. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling Kitty Norville series, about a werewolf who hosts a radio call-in show for supernatural creatures, as well as the recent books Martians Abroad and Amaryllis and Other Stories. Her new novel, Bannerless, will be published in July by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. So, Carrie, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thank you. Then next up, we've got Aaron Lindsay, who you may remember from our panel on Incorporated back in episode 247 and our panel on Brain Dead back in episode 239. She's the author of the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels from Ace, as well as the Nicholas Lenoir series of historical paranormal detective novels from Rock, which she writes under the name E.L. Tetensor. She spent over a decade working for the United Nations in dozens of countries around the world, and she also writes the Villain of the Month feature over at Pornokitch.com. Her latest Bloodbound novel, Bloodsworn, is out now. So, Aaron, welcome to the show. Great to be back. And also joining us today is Sam J. Miller, who you may remember from our panel on Sense8 back in episode 157. He's a community organizer in New York City, and his short fiction appears in magazines such as Lightspeed, Nightmare, and Strange Horizons, and has been nominated for the Nebula and Theodore Sturgeon Awards, and has won the Shirley Jackson Award. His first novel, The Art of Starving, about a gay teen who believes that starving himself gives him superpowers, will be published in July by HarperCollins. So Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, and so Aaron, so this uh, panel on Taboo was your idea. So why don't we start with you and have you just tell us a little bit about how did you get interested in this show in the first place and kind of what attracted you to it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think how I got interested was I was I was hooked from the first trailer that I saw. Um, we watch a lot of shows on FX and the, the first trailer really, really got me. It was just so beautifully shot and so beautifully cut. Um, and I just love the atmosphere. And I think, I mean, anybody who's read my Nicola Lenoir books will not be surprised to to hear that this show is completely in my wheelhouse. Um, you know, it's very dark and gritty and grim. Um, and it's got a lot of similarities with that series, you know, gothic regency, tortured anti-hero with a dark past, um, spooky su- supernatural elements, just all the stuff that I really love. Um, and of course, Tom Hardy who is exactly what you would expect from Tom Hardy in this role. That's interesting that you say you're a big fan of the FX network. I'm not sure. I couldn't honestly swear that I know what any other FX shows are. Like, what are the other FX shows that you have been watching? <laughs> I'm kind of all over the place. I like The Americans. So good. Um, I loved Justified for all its flaws. I really liked that show. Uh, what else? Those are the ones that are coming to mind. They do Legion. Um, I haven't seen Legion yet. I keep meaning to. Yeah, Legion is fantastic. It's about my favorite show right now. Oh, okay. I definitely have to check it out. <laughs> it's pretty great. And they have Fargo as well. Of course. Fargo. I love Fargo, which is shot in my hometown. Nice. And it's really weird seeing people standing outside buildings on my street, and one of them's even wearing my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's interesting because I'm actually way behind on television always because I'm so busy with the podcast. And so you may notice some of these panels come out maybe a little bit after other people have seen the show already. But it's because mm-hmm. I kind of wait for people to tell me, oh, this show is really, really good. And then I'm like, all right, well, then I'll watch it and we can do a panel about it. So maybe I'll, I haven't even watched Legion yet either. I've heard that's really good. So maybe that'll be coming up on our um, on our uh, you know, action plan here. Um, but so uh, how about Carrie? Um, did you how did you first hear about? taboo and kind of what were your first impressions of it? Yeah, I'm trying to remember how I first heard about it. Um, I'm not exactly sure, probably some of the online buzz. And also, I'm a big fan of Tom Hardy ever since Fury Road. Uh, If you go back and listen to that episode, you'll hear me (laughs) gush all about that movie. Um, I'm also a fan of historical. And the thing that drew me in is it's set in the same time period as uh, Jane Austen stories are in Jane Austen movies. And I loved the idea of this kind of mirror universe, Jane Austen, (laughs) like all of these characters could be in a Jane Austen story, except um, the mood would be very, very different. 
So I, I was, a, I, you know, I love, I'm an Anglophile. I love stories about London. I love stories about that time period. Um, and I wanted to see what it was all about. And of, of course, I watched the first episode and had to watch it all the way through. Um, I pretty much binged it. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't read a lot of romance novels, but I've certainly heard that many of them are set in this this period. The Regency period is kind of mm-hmm. the go the go to setting for romance novels, right? It's 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 kind of its own genre uh, within romance, the Regency yeah. uh, setting, and um, I mean, not all historical romance is set in the Regency, but the Regency is definitely known for historical romance. You just don't see a lot of other historicals um, outside of the romance romance genre set in this period, which is, I think, another thing that makes Taboo stand out a little bit, that it's this uh, kind of War of 1812 um, English gentry uh, setting uh, that's so popular, but you only see this one very narrow kind of parlor drawing room romance side of it. Um, until now. <laughs> well, right. This is kind of like, it's like a Regency romance, except the ex- exact opposite of that, basically. Exactly. It's, it's the mirror exact universe opposite. Regency romance, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, how about Sam? Are you uh, Were you really into this period, or how did you get interested in this show? So I just saw the trailer, and I will join everyone else in jumping on the Tom Hardy, <laughs> uh, hardcore Tom Hardy addict bandwagon because I'll watch him do anything, especially if he spends most of the show with no pants on. <laughs> um, and so I saw the trailer. My husband and I watch a lot of television. So uh, we we saw this coming, and it looked really good. I mean, I, I feel like this is the anti-imperialist Great Gatsby that I've been waiting for my whole life without knowing it. Hmm. I mean, could you say a little bit more about why why is there such a fascination, you think, with Tom Hardy? Uh, he's super hot. David, I just have to spoiler alert right there. He's he's really attractive, uh, and he does a really good job at inhabiting uh, really menacing but super appealing characters. I've found that I have been answering people in staff meetings with his grunt <laughs> from Taboo. Uh, it's a very eloquent and compelling grunt that communicates. I don't really care about anything you just said. But let's move on. <laughs> yeah, he he's not charming at all. Like you know, so many of, of kind of the um, you know romantic lead actors have have this inherent charm, and and he's he's got the inherent bad boy thing going. Mm. I I think too what personally I find really interesting about him is I, I read somewhere I don't remember where that that Tom Hardy is a character actor trapped in a leading man's body <laughs> and this is so so true um, he really is a character actor and he likes to inhabit these quirky characters and he does it so well and with such understatement and in a curious way I found myself thinking about Jonathan Banks in uh, both in Breaking Bad and in Better Call Saul in, in terms of just for, for a guy who's the main character of the show, he doesn't have that much dialogue. There's, I mean, he does, but there's long periods of silence and, and grunts and looks where he conveys so much without actually doing very much. And that's, I, I think that understatement, that less is more approach is really interesting to watch. This show was actually Tom Hardy's idea. I don't know if you guys know anything about this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but so basically, uh, my, uh, what I gather is that he and his dad kind of c- came up with the idea. His dad is a, a screenwriter and sort of theater person, I think. And then they they so they're doing the show with this guy Stephen Knight, who's done lots of screen screenwriting and uh, TV writing and stuff. And Steve uh, Stephen Knight wanted to do this movie Lock, which is just the whole movie. It's a feature film about a guy in a car talking on his phone, and he wanted Tom Hardy for it. And they kind of worked out a deal where if Tom Hardy would be in lock, then Stephen Knight would help him out, you know, help bring Taboo to the to the t- to, hmm. to television. Um, and maybe they they crossed paths in, in Peaky Blinders. And, and just one one more thing to say on Tom Hardy was that I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I was seriously well through the, the season of, of Peaky Blinders where Tom Hardy appears before I realized it was Tom Hardy. I didn't recognize him at all. He inhabited mm-hmm. that character so thoroughly. Oh, wow. Yeah, I still sort of secretly refuse to admit that he's Bane in Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same guy. I just can't, not. can't admit not, that. Yeah, Not one of the finer moments. <laughs> we, we can just pretend that movie never happened. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, so, so Sam, you said that this is kind of your, what did you say, your, your anti-imperial um, Great Gatsby. Could you talk a little more about that? 
Yeah, so I'm a real sucker for these narratives about people who participate in a system of exploitation and oppression um, and then decide to burn it all down. Uh, and that he, through means that we don't really, we aren't really privy to, has acquired this great wealth that enables him to move in society in a number of different ways and to achieve things that most people can't. So I, I'm really, I don't know if anyone ever watched the ABC primetime soap opera Revenge, uh, which was about a young woman in the Hamptons doing basically the same plot as Taboo, um, uh, except it's contemporary and not nearly as sexy because uh, it doesn't have Tom Hardy. Um, but I just love that that narrative of somebody who's coming to destroy and who knows everybody's secrets and uh, has has sort of this is able to see through all the hypocrisy and and lies and exploitation that the system is built on. Well, right. So let's for people who haven't seen the show, let's talk a little bit about what actually is happening. And this is not this is sort of something you piece together over multiple episodes. So um, but so so basically Tom Hardy was and you guys can stop me if I'm getting stuff wrong. But so Tom Hardy was basically in the employ of the East India uh, Tea Company and was sent um, on a a ship that turns out to have been a, a slave ship, uh, and he was sort of an illegal slave sh- slave ship that was purposefully scuttled, and um, all sorts of terrible things happened to him and were probably done by him, and he's returned to London with uh, no other mission than to just bring down the East India Tea Company. Yeah, um, as the sh- as the show opens, his father has just died, and. Since he's presumed to be dead on this shipwreck, uh, his sister is going to inherit the estate until he literally shows up at the funeral and throws everything into massive chaos. And that's the the moment that that launches everything else that happens is that he he takes this inheritance that the East India Company thought that they they were going to be able to just be able to buy from his sister, and he marches in and um, just upsets everybody for the the following eight episodes. <laughs> And he strides in in vintage Tom Hardy fashion in a top hat and billowing coat down the center of the church. It's uh, it's a, practically a, a, a John Woo moment. But um, but the the piece the inheritance and I think this is important to mention the inheritance in question is a piece of land on the coast of modern day British Columbia in Canada called Nootka Sound. So the East India Company wants uh, wants it because. Um, of its location, as do the Americans. And the the war between America and Britain is perhaps coming to a close. And this, whoever wins this piece of ter- territory wins the key port of Vancouver. Um, and so that is that geopolitical reality that sort of drives a lot of the conflict and sets the players against one another. And the fact that uh, Tom Hardy's character, um, James Delaney, knows about this geopolitical reality and why it's important um, that's what enables him to set these players against one another. Now, Aaron, you mentioned that you have this historical series, right? Is this when is it set around the same time? It is. It's set in a, a time and a place reminiscent of of London at the in the early part of the nineteenth century. It's actually set in a fictional place, um, but it's it is very reminiscent of that. And like Taboo, it doesn't show the sort of Regency romance side of it. There's no green fields and um, and lovely estates and and all of the rest of it. It is very dark and gritty. Um, and one of the things that I really liked about Taboo is I can't remember the last time I I saw a show that had such an unflattering but also very accurate portrayal of what. Um, you know, sort of early industrial London looked like, well, just pre-industrial London. And it's just, it's mud. There's so much mud in this show. <laughs> mud is practically a character in this show. And, and everybody's you know dirty stinks. all the time. <laughs> oh, totally. And you can, and, you know, people's injuries look like they're completely, you know, going septic. It's just, it's just really unflattering and well done. Um and don't ask me what it says about me that I'm that I'm drawn to this, but all of those little details um, really come together in this and make it a vivid palette. Like just one look at the color palette that they use in the trailer tells you everything you need to know about this show. I mean, would you say that this is a pretty historically accurate show or is it more of a like an effect, this the setting that they've created? 
I mean, I think they definitely rely a lot on atmosphere. In terms of historical accuracy, um, they haven't really dealt with specific historical events enough for for me to say. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not an expert in turning saltpeter into gunpowder, which is something that that happens during the course of the show. Um, I, I do think their portrayal of the East India Company, uh, while perhaps a, a little more unflattering, just I mean. Not that it's unjustifiably unflattering, but we just see only the unflattering angle of of the East India Company. Um, that's, but it's it seems to me to be a, a fairly accurate portrayal of the power that that company wielded. And I I can't remember which character says it early on in the show. Um, says something to Delaney to the effect of, "When you left, uh, the East India Company was an important trading company, and now it is God Almighty." Um, yeah. And indeed, the company seems to be at least on equal footing with the crown in in this period, and that definitely rings true to me. Yeah, the um, Delaney's nemesis, the the head of this branch of the East India Company that he deals with, is played by Jonathan Price, who I I also love, and I love seeing him and everything. And it, it was such a surprise to see him play such an unrelentingly cruel and evil character. The way he he plays, um, you know that this. East India Company representative. I agree that that I, I'm not sure how accurate the portrayal of the East India Company is, but I think it does a good job of uh, kind of indicating the power that that it had at this this point in history. Mm. And Jonathan Price is so great. Uh, the, this one of the things that I wanted to mention, and maybe this is a good time, is just the glut of of superb supporting actors oh, in yeah. this in this show. And it, I would be I would struggle to pick one. Actually, no, I wouldn't. Tom Hollander steals the show for me <laughs> as um, as a chemist slash hedonist slash I don't know what he is, um, doctor. Um, but Jonathan Price kind of is as this head of the East India Company, or at least a very senior figure therein. Um, Sir Stuart Strange, is that right? I yep. think that is, yeah. Yeah. He, it kind of felt to me like he was playing the same character as in Pirates of the Caribbean, but evil. Yes, yes. <laughs> like the evil twin of the of the character from Pirates of the Caribbean. All right, so let's talk about so you you mentioned some of these other characters. Let's let's get all these characters in here. So we have let's talk about um James's sister uh wait, Zil Zilpha. Zilpha, right? yeah. Um who wants to talk a little bit about Zilpha? I I sort of <laughs> I I really want to talk to about her, but what, how that character was handled towards the end of the the series made me very angry. Um, me too. And I don't know if you're ready to talk about that part of no, it. No, let's 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 do the setup first, and then we'll get into okay. the the development a little bit later. But so, what what was your first impression of Zilpha? Uh, she's like we've been saying, she's the the kind of character that you would find in other shows, but a more dark, um, sinister version. That she's. The, the you know the young woman of the gentry who has to marry well in order to secure her own financial um, safety, and you know with her brother gone and her father dead, and she's now married uh, to a not very nice man, and and she is trying to look out for her own future. And then her brother comes back, and we come to find out that part of the reason her brother left is the two of them had carried on an affair um, some years before when they were both teenagers, I believe, if I've got the timeline right. And so there's, that's, I believe, where the title comes from. That's the taboo that, that you know, kind of everything points back to. Um, so her brother comes back and it, it upsets her world completely. And, and she's, um, the, the actress who plays her is the same actress who played uh, the wife of Rob Stark, whose name escapes me. It's what Tobisa was her name? in the show. Uh, Una Chaplin is the actress. Yeah. Um, anyway, she she does, I think, a, a really great job of playing this woman as, uh, you know, very brittle sort of fragile sort of uh, psychological state that you can, you know, from the moment that first scene in the church when when Tom Hardy walks in during the funeral, you you see that she's just kind of on the edge of losing it completely, and okay, she does it. I think everything. a really good job. <laughs> I mean, Sam, do you want to jump in here? And, uh, what did you think of the characters? Or are there any other characters you want to mention? 
Well, I do. I did want to shout out Zilpha because I think one of the things I love about her is she's sort of the crux of the supernatural elements in this show, which I think are pretty low key. And for most of the show, we can sort of imagine that uh, it is a facet of Tom Hardy's madness that he imagines himself to be communing with spirits uh, and and to be seeing them in dreams and to be able to communicate with the dead. But then Zilpha sees them, too, and Zilpha can interact with him supernaturally. Um, which I think is really interesting. And uh, you could argue that they're just both fucking crazy. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but I do think there's something more to it. Um, so I loved her, but my real favorite, if I had to pick someone other than Tom Hardy, uh, is Franca Potente as Helga, um, mm, yeah. who I think is just a super, I love her in everything she's in. Uh, and she was, she was really awesome in this. And I really loved her, uh, her role in the, the, the final episodes. Um, in terms of like how she, what she does, and why we as viewers think it's terrible, but also completely understand why she does it. Well, but maybe Sam, for for people who haven't seen the show, say a little bit more about just who is this character. Oh, she's the owner of the brothel that has been operating <laughs> illegally in the property, in the offices of Delaney's father, which had been basically abandoned at the waterfront, and she'd been running a brothel out of it. And <laughs> he uh, kicks her out initially, but then finds that it would be helpful in various ways when he needs things like prostitute urine to have a brothel on hand so he allows her to to continue to operate and she knows things she knows everything going on in that area and he finds that very useful as well yeah he ha- he has a use for her as he has a use for everyone in the show yes <laughs> um, but but there there are a couple of other standout characters i wanted to flag the one i already mentioned uh tom hollander um as dr I think it's pronounced Chumley or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> who, who's this? Uh, and he provides the most of the comic relief, but it's not slapstick comedy at all. It's just a very wry, acerbic wit. Um, and, and he's really a delight. And he's he's recruited. It's kind of an Ocean's Eleven thing. He's recruited to the team um, as, as the chemist because they need, uh, well, they have various uses for him, uh, mainly revolving around explosives. Um, then there's the, the trusty servant brace who Mm -hmm. was also a delight. He was, he's kind of the super sour Alfred to Tom Hardy's Batman. Um, and, and he's great. And then there's Lorna and Lorna is the stepmother, I guess you would call her. She is, she turns up somewhat dramatically in episode two or maybe the end of episode one, claiming to be the wife, uh, of the late father even though she's actually about James's age. Um, and she's this beautiful actress and they were secretly married in Dublin, etc. And so one of the more interesting relationships in the show, well, it's a sort of a, it's a sort of a threesome is, is the unhappy sort of triangle of, of relationships between the servant brace uh, Delaney himself and, and Lorna who shows up. Um, and she ends up being a very interesting character, but she's a character whose purpose totally escapes me. And, um, and is maybe something that, that we can talk about when we get into mm-hmm. some of the more of the, the details about these story arcs and their fates, but, um, but well, a, a likable character. And I think very, very well played. Well, right, let's save that for a little bit later. But when you mentioned the pronunciation of Chumley's name, that kind of made me think, did anybody watch this show without subtitles? No, no, <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> I totally I tried. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, London Docklands kind of uh, accents in there for sure. And how would you? How much did did you just not mind that you were missing stuff, or did you pretty much get everything, Carrie? I I think you can get just about everything from context, if nothing else. And I think maybe also if you watch enough. BBC, you know, you you start to pick up on it. Um, I didn't find a problem with it at all, um, but 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 again, it's it's I, you know how much how much of it is that Tom Hardy doesn't really say anything through the whole um, you know doesn't say much through the series, and uh, and there's just lots of different accents uh, you know as you would find in London in just about any period. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it that's not a question that had occurred to me until just now. Mm. I, I did watch it after a while with, with the closed captioning on, but not because of the accents. Um, maybe it's just the sound quality on my speaker system, but I, I found Tom Hardy delivers almost all of his lines in a, in this various grunts and growls. 
and a lot of them I just found too muddy to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were moments when that was a little bit over top. It reminded it wasn't quite as intrusive as Christian Bale's Batman, but <laughs> uh, but definitely moments where it probably didn't have to be you know, growling on 11, we could have been growling at a solid seven and still got the effect. (laughs) What did you, I mean, Sam was mentioning the supernatural aspects. What did you guys, Carrie and Aaron, what did you guys think of the way the show handled the supernatural aspects? I I think it's a little problematic, to be honest. Um, And in, in fact, that's something that I've been wanting to get a hold of. And I'm not sure anybody's done a really good kind of in depth post colonial critique of the whole show. Um, while while I think the show is absolutely anti-imperialist and anti-colonial, um, you know, there there's a level at which the storyline is kind of just like the storyline of Iron Fist. You've got this, you know, white guy who goes out to the colonies and learns strange spiritual things and then comes back with these powers that maybe they're powers or maybe he's crazy. Maybe we don't know what's going on. And you know, it's subtle enough that you could interpret it in multiple different ways. If you want there to be an actual supernatural element, there is. Um, but it's this vague kind of African voodoo that we don't really know anything about. And that it it, it seems to be problematic to me. Um, there's He gets his, his, his perception of his supernatural powers from two different sources, his time in Africa. And the other thing is, is we find out his mother um, was from the Salish tribe in, in the Pacific Northwest uh, Native Americans. And he's got some spiritual heritage from there as well. So it's, it, you know, once again, this kind of age old story of, you know, bring, um, you know, bringing back these spiritual elements from the colonies and, and removing them from their context. And, and you know, so that's an aspect of the the um, kind of colonialism in the show, the, the way that the show tackles these colonial issues that I wasn't entirely comfortable with all the time. I think the show's heart was in the right place, but it relied on some of these tropes, I think, a little too much. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, and, and I had the same reaction. I think the supernatural elements work, um, well for me for two reasons. They're, they're quite subtle, which is what I tend to prefer. Um, and to the point where it's almost reminds me a little of Hamlet, where as, um, as we were saying earlier, there, there are moments when you are not even sure that it's, it's supernatural at all. It just could be that he's totally mad and the in his sister is mad and what are we really seeing anyway? And it's uh, so you can really question whether it exists. And that, that works for me. What didn't work for me is exactly what Carrie was just talking about um, so far. And I will try to give the show the benefit of the doubt. This has only been one season and we have to see how it develops. Although the fact that they're bound now, I believe for Antigua does not necessarily bode well for, <laughs> Um, for solving this problem. But up until now, this, the supernatural elements appear to be indeed this product of these exotic far flung places where, where non white people do uh, dark, um, dark things. Uh, and Delaney refers repeatedly to the, the deeds he committed in Africa, which he doesn't go into any kind of detail, but he's rumored to have consumed human flesh and he doesn't deny this rumor um he performs all these sorts of rituals he has all these visions and indeed that seems the wellsprings for for these things are either from africa or from his mother's nutka tribe and that's uncomfortable um and and i do hope that they realize that it's uncomfortable and either make the make it more explicit whether this is or isn't real um or if they don't decide to go that route then at least expand the types of people who are experiencing supernatural elements and the, you know, the, the powers and places from where they derive. Now, my hope is that getting out of London and actually going to the colonies will help contextualize this a little bit and maybe get some perspectives of, you know, some of the non-white people that he has been interacting with. And, you know, that's, that's something else that I think is lacking in the show is that for a show that's anti-imperialist in, in ethos, uh, there's, um, a lack of perspectives from the colonies themselves. Uh, I want to give Sam a chance to jump in here. Sam, do you have anything you wanted to, to add to what uh, Aaron and Carrie have been saying? Yeah, no, I think it's it's definitely spot on. Uh, I, I admire the show for being so much about challenging the the sort of 
what's what's fucked up about the East India Company and sort of British the British rise to power on the backs of uh, the slave trade and the exploitation of India and the colonies, um, and and I and I agree that it, there are some some ways in which that's deployed that aren't completely successful. If my memory serves, I think the only ghosts he ever sees are all people of color. He um, isn't visited by anybody um, uh, of European descent, and it just per- is part of this uh, sort of uh, perpetuation of the marginalization of folks. Um, uh, but what what I do really think is interesting about the show on that on that score is it's sort of part of this trend of sort of like genocide revenge narratives that we've seen a few examples of. The most most uh, significant ones I think are Django Unchained and Inglorious Bastards, where right, you know right. it's, it's not it's not historically accurate. It's like let's go and like kill the motherfuckers who did all this terrible stuff. Right. Um, and you know I actually had a problem with both of those movies because. I felt like as much as I love to see Nazis die and as much as I want to see Hitler get shot in the face, um, I feel like even when we know they're not historically accurate, it provides the kind of emotional catharsis that enables us to walk out of the theater thinking, oh, phew, like glad that's settled um, <laughs> and sort of uh, fails to sort of leave us with the sort of lingering sort of really problematic legacies of both slavery and the Holocaust. Um, and the ways in which the ends of those oppressive periods didn't result in complete justice. And so, um, you know, I really wish someone had exterminated the heads of the East India Company um, and, and sort of prevented the further sort of the savaging of India that we saw throughout the 19th century. Um, and, you know, I think in that, on that tip, the show isn't very historically accurate. Um, so I think this show does a better job of problematizing that uh, the context and saying like, this is, this is one piece of, 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 uh, imperialism and oppression and, uh, that the, you know, taking these people out isn't going to so- completely solve the problem mm-hmm. and that getting, getting revenge doesn't necessarily make you a okay. Yeah. And, and I think they do a good job too of the fact, I mean, you could argue that it's problematic that it's Tom Hardy at the, at the spearhead of this, um, you know, this revenge narrative in, in as much as he's not actually the aggrieved party. Um, but one thing that I think that they did do well is they resisted the temptation to make his character um, too much of a, of a champion for justice. I mean, this guy is still very clearly, um, you know, he's, he says horrible homophobic things to his, um, to his friend who's, uh, who's acting as an informant. One of the, um, one of the members of the of the Ocean's Eleven team he assembles is a, a a guy called Godfrey who is a secretary for the East India Company and is, is in the room when all the sensitive details are shared. But he is also a closet homosexual in a time when that's probably I mean it was definitely illegal, possibly punishable by death, um, and, and so he's got he's very easy to blackmail. Um, and, and James uses this to his advantage to get him to act as a spy. Um, Godfrey also, um, has feelings for James because everyone in the show has feelings for James, which we could talk about later as being perhaps an element they could have done better on. Um, but in any case, uh, so he's, he's quite emotionally invested as well in, um, in the conspiracy and for for which James rewards him by being an, an absolute asshole to him at every available opportunity, um, including really hitting him where it hurts in terms of his sexuality and calling him half a man and all of the, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and I think similarly, he doesn't. I mean, he doesn't come across as being particularly socially enlightened in any way. He's pretty much horrible to a lot of to a lot of people. I guess my point being that it it, it would be uncomfortably close to the white champion narrative had they not resisted the temptation to make their character too enlightened. I'm kind of curious, speak, speaking of Godfrey, does anyone know he belongs to kind of this secret community within London? I was just wondering, does anyone know any more about the historical context of that? Or are there have there been other stories dealing with those sorts of um, communities before? It, there, there's a historical basis for that kind of thing, that there were clubs um, you know, very secret. You had to kind of know the secret handshake to get into them. But there, there were clubs, there were outlets. Um, you know, I'm not sure how historically accurate this particular portrayal of it is, but 
but there is a basis for it that there there as there has always been there was a subculture um for you know for for lgbtq um people um to to meet each other um that we just don't know a lot about because a lot of it wasn't recorded and it was so secret mm. yeah they were called molly houses which the which they say in the show but they I only recognized it when I had the subtitles on because, like, a character in the background says it in one scene. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, do you know any more about that, Sam? No, just that, that it's a real thing and that it was a pretty common space for queer folks to meet and that there would probably be a degree of uh, sex work happening there, but that it was also a, uh, you know, a sort of gender non-normative space to express gender in unconventional ways. Um, and I also really actually liked the fact that uh, Delaney was homophobic because I was I'm always nervous about when a character is a historically modern in their sensibilities. And it's totally, like, uh, totally cool with shit that people were typically not cool with in that period. And, and I think it also speaks to one of the things that I really love about his character, which is that this is a man who's been just totally damaged beyond repair by imperialism and by the things that he's been asked to do in the service of expanding british power and wealth um and that he was sort of like a you know a, a soldier like a kid who got who ended up in a military function for the east india company and um as a result got had to do some some things that were so terrible that they helped sort of break him as a person and so he is just this totally destructive uh i wouldn't say hate filled because i don't get the sense that he hates really but that he's just so full of, of violence and and he's so twisted that uh he is trying to bring some, down something that's terrible, but he's pretty terrible himself. I've really appreciated Godfrey being in the show and all that character, uh, because we do see throughout the show that, that Delaney attracts uh, marginalized people and, and marginal characters and kind of gives them a safe place. You know, it, it may be, um, you know, because he is using them, but when they ally with him, they have a protection that they didn't have before. And, and, those characters gave a way for the show to talk about a lot of these issues, I think. Well, I mean, one thing that really struck me is that basically there's an inverse correlation between how high you are on the social scale in the show and how sympathetically the show views you, right? I mean, it really, I felt like the the less, um, the, the characters from the lower classes were portrayed much more sympathetic or basically all the you know, the upper class, the royalty and the um, business moguls and stuff were all just total assholes. Yeah, and so, and in some cases downright clown like. I, as much as I love Mark Gattis, um, <laughs> that that turn as the 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 regent, the prince regent, uh, <laughs> didn't didn't do it for me at all. It just it it didn't it it was just so obviously a fat suit, <laughs> so I just obviously a rubber <laughs> face, and and I mean I don't know anything about that person historically, and so I can't comment on the extent to which the ridiculous excess of that character was accurate but it it sure stuck out like a sore thumb i was me. wondering if he had some sort of medical condition that made it look like he was wearing prosthetics <laughs> <laughs> i just kept thinking of blackadder uh the second season of blackadder uh, yeah with i can hugh, see that hugh lowry <laughs> playing that character um yeah i can see it that. was it was reminiscent but one thing that I was going to say a, a moment ago, um, just to, to pick up on what Sam was talking about, I think it's interesting, you know, we're talking about this imperialism angle as, as it being sort of the driving force of the show. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's going to be the case. I think we, we have to be in wait and see mode. One of the things that I think works very well, I mean, and, and, and again, one, one of the reasons this show is totally in my wheelhouse is, is at its heart, it's a mystery. Um, we don't really know what the master plan is. We know that there's elements of revenge, there's elements of redemption, but we don't know sort of what, what Delaney's game is here. Um, and as much as his revenge on the East India Company is a huge part of season one, he blows up the East India Company at the end. Stuart Strange is to all appearances dead. Um, he gets his revenge. And so is there more to it? And I would argue that as damaged as he clearly is by his experience with the slave vessel, he's also damaged by a lot of things that vastly predate that. 
So his relationship with his sister, his relationship with his mother, who we haven't mentioned. Um, his mother was, uh, we did mention a, a member of the Nutka tribe. She was apparently, to all appearances, purchased by his father um, for beads or gunpowder. I wasn't totally clear on that. Um, she then uh, is caught to all appearances, trying to drown young baby James. And so the, the dad has her thrown in Bedlam Insane Asylum. And she she dies a very tragic death. James is really tortured by this. And the figure that appears to him most in his visions is that of his mother. So I, I would argue he was a broken man before he set foot on that ship. My point being, I, I'm very interested to see, is the East India Company angle over um, are there other angles about uh, about imperialism that are going to continue to drive this? What is what is actually the narrative here? Yeah, I, I think the the American angle still hasn't been uh, wrapped up at all. Mm. I think he's, mm -hmm. he's going to go to the Americas, and we're going to get to see uh, uh, what happened on that side of the Atlantic um, mm. and what imperialism looks like, um, you know, in the Caribbean. Right. And Antigua at this time is a, is a sort of central point in the Atlantic slave trade. Um, and the Caribbean is where slaves are, are sort of brought to be broken from, from Africa. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what's, I, I agree. It's a good analysis to be skeptical of the extent to which the East India Company is the, the villain of this show and whether or not that was just you know, is it the arc villain? Is it the season one villain? <laughs> um, uh, so, so, so I think you that that's right. Um, and I am interested to see where it's going to go next. There's certainly, you know, it, it could be he decides to take down American slavery next. Um, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to see that, that plot line, but I don't know how realistic that is. One of the things that I think makes the show work so well is precisely this element of mystery, but I do wonder how how you sustain that and there there are moments where it's it's very hard with mystery there's you if you withhold too much it becomes very frustrating um and i think the fact that uh we get through we we get the plot in drips and drabs works very well uh particularly getting the backstory in drips and drabs over the course of the season works very well but i don't know how long you can sustain that type of approach without it becoming frustrating um, at a certain point, we have to understand a character enough. We have to understand their motivations. We have to understand their capabilities. We have to understand their goals. And right now, I don't feel like I have a handle on any of that with James Delaney. And that's okay for now. But I, I'm not sure how, how long they can sustain that before it, it starts to feel very esoteric and it's hard to remain invested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Carrie. I guess you you said you had some. You wanted to talk a little, little bit about what happens toward the end of the show, right? Um, with, yeah. with Zilpha. You want to talk about that? Just because that's that's where it just about lost me. If I was going to stop watching, that was going to be it. And it's like I still don't know if I'm going to watch the second season because of what they did with her. Um, which is, uh, Delaney breaks up with her. Um, he's not going to carry on the affair with her anymore. Uh, she's killed her husband at that point. Um, he leaves her and she jumps off a bridge and kills herself, um, which was so kind of gothic and trite and cliche that I couldn't believe that they had done that with all of the other interesting subversive things that they do on this show. Why did they do, you know, the kind of the most obvious cliche they possibly could have with her, especially when they had set her up at that point? You know, a widow in this situation has a lot of power, especially if she has her husband's property and she she is now her own master. They were setting her up to be more than what they ended up doing with her. And so it was really disappointing to me that that she's gone. She's just dead. That's and that's it. She died well, of a broken heart. And... I don't think she's dead. OK, well, well, and also also, Carrie, I mean, to be honest, so many characters died in the last episode that were good characters too that i really wonder if they just like didn't weren't able to get contracts for like half the cast because it just didn't seem <laughs> or, or, or organic to me to the story that so many of these characters would die at this point in the story um i, I think with, with with zilpha i mean i think my guess is we will continue to see her um and and i was maybe thinking of mentioning this when we talked about uh, the 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 fact that the ghosts were uniformly people of color i suspect that Zilpha, if she if she is dead, uh, will join the ranks of the ghosts 
that that haunt James. But I, I completely agree that this was a super lazy way to wrap up that story. I'm not sure I agree they were setting her up for anything else. And I think it goes to their treatment of her to me was predictable, not only because we've seen it in a million similar stories, but because it touches on, I think, one of the, the deeper issues that I had with the show, which is the, the female characters in general. Um, granted, most of the characters revolve around James. They are they are all of use to him somehow. They are mysteriously drawn to his center of gravity somehow. And so it's not exclusive to the female characters. But I think they they really lacked agency for me in in the larger sense. So even mm-hmm. even uh, Lorna with all of her um with all of her chutzpah and the fact that she's really smart and she she goes toe to toe with all of the other characters in terms of the small things. She doesn't have any purpose in this narrative other no, than No, she's got no motivation. I she's got no she ma- like overnight she's suddenly completely in James's thrall for reasons that are never really justified or explained. Um we suppose by the end that she has feelings for him, although that seemed to happen virtually overnight. She was set up in the first episodes of her appearance as an oppositional character and that vanished almost mm-hmm. instantly with with no real pretext or justification for it and instead she simply becomes one of the flunkies and and, and I can't really figure out why to the extent that she's going to leave her entire life behind and go with him to Antigua she has no real purpose not just not just one of the flunkies but her main function her main narrative function in the final episodes is to be menaced you know is to be in peril and and for him to have to, to do things to do, to rescue her and and of course we have to have we must absolutely have sexual violence either threatened or <laughs> committed against both of our main female characters um and very probably the third as well although we we don't really see i mean Helga we can presume has lots of sexual violence in her life being a madam i am so over this oh and i also <laughs> so want to so over this yeah and i want to throw we haven't talked yet about winter uh, who's the the child uh, um, the, 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 the other yeah the, the black child that <laughs> That he takes under his wing, that Delaney takes under his wing, and then she's essentially fridged, um, you know, to, you know, killed to advance the plot. Yeah. Um, and we we don't get anything le- you know more about her either. So so yeah, there's definitely some some really problematic uh, handling of some of this. And yeah, I mean Zilpha's character, I I would have been able to put up with. A lot of that, I maybe it would have the fact that she's kind of this this waif that gets bounced around between the the, the men and abused in every possible way that a person can be abused and is is really fragile and brittle through the whole thing and then flings herself off a bridge. It's very gothic and and in that sense, I guess I hate to use the word appropriate, but but at least it's in it's in keeping with the theme. I could have put up with it were it not totally of a piece with the treatment of the female characters in general. Like if she was a complete statistical outlier in a cast that had lots of women with agency and a purpose and a motivation that doesn't completely result revolve around the male hero, I could have possibly looked the other way, but because that isn't the case. Well, uh, and it, it, it fools you, you know, it, it's, it's like we've gotten halfway towards good female characters because all you know, we've talked about all of these characters are some of our favorites, and they're all really interesting. But when it comes to the story, they just don't get to do much. And that's the other half of the equation that it feels like we're missing is that people, you know, TV in particular is like TV knows how to make good female characters. It just doesn't give them anything to do after they after they put them on the screen. Um, and yeah, yeah it, get, it gets frustrating. Although, although I will say that I love that I love Zilpha. Zilpha did manage to surprise us narratively by killing her husband. I thought that was great. I was really happy she did that. <laughs> I'd, been wait- I'd been waiting for him to die since the first episode, and I was terrified that it would be Delaney who would do it, because that would just be awful. Um, so I was really happy that that happened, and the way that that threw the plot into into a little bit of chaos, because it, um, it was something that Delaney had not really uh, anticipated or, you know, sort of like engineered. Um, but again, it just ma- that just makes it all the more um, disappointing when she's just uh, thrown, thrown mm-hmm. away. Actually, Actually, speaking of Thor and dying, I have a question about that duel because I don't know a lot about duels. But is that how it usually works that you walk toward each other and if one person misses, the other person can just go up and put their pistol against the person's forehead and pull the trigger? I know more about sword duels. Um, my 
my thought with the pistol duels is that both parties are planted, that they stand still um, and each gets a shot. Um, because those, those muzzle-loaded pistols were just terrible. The, you couldn't aim them. <laughs> you know, they, they were really inaccurate. And so the, you know, the chances were both parties would walk away. Um, but yeah, I, I was not aware that continuing to walk was part of the, the standard duel. But it is Delaney we're talking about, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I just took it that he was breaking the rules and nobody had the the wherewithal to stop him. Um, but I Well, mean, I guess because the second had been paid off. That's the, that's what yeah. the second is supposed to do, right, is, is yeah. shoot him if he does something like that. But then he had actually bribed the second. So I guess that makes sense. Well, and you could you could argue, well, he hadn't bribed the second. The second was working for the East India Company. And so you could view actually the, the walking as a sort of provocation to say, if the second doesn't try to stop me, then I absolutely know that my hunch that he's in the pocket of the company is correct. Um, which which proved to be the case that, that he was in the pocket of the company, which James knew because James knows everything. <laughs> although we don't really know if that's supernatural he, or he's just really damn clever. I think the only character that had a clear reason for doing what he was doing in a certain way was the chemist. Um, and I, I say that because his reason for doing it is that it was just kind of amusing and, and, and interesting. And he liked to, to be a part of it. Everybody else's motivation, like everybody else is just kind of, um, I don't know why they're in, why they're in it. <laughs> they're, they're in it because James is just awesome. I mean, Godfrey at least was acting out of love in a, in, and blackmail. Like, Godfrey did love uh, Delaney at one point, and you get the impression that he still has really strong feelings for him. That's true. Which yeah, he Delaney, did. He, which you're Delaney right. Manipulates. You're right. I, I, I stand corrected. That was one other character who had a clear reason for taking the choices he took. Love and Blackmail is the name of my next band. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did love the manufacturing gunpowder subplot. That was one of my uh, favorite parts of the uh, show. It was great. Everything that guy said was great. But I don't like what happened to him at the end. Can we talk about that? Um, there were a couple of yeah storytelling choices at the end there that, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. One obviously was Zilpha throwing herself off a bridge. Another was the decision to leave the loyal brace behind. Oh, no. um, I think I think that's that's a shame because for, for a couple of reasons. One, I just really like the character. I'm going to miss him. But two, he served, I think, a valuable role in that he was kind of James's conscience. Right, he was right. like he was the real human being. He was the adult in the room who saw the world in a way that more closely approached the way we see the world. The only other character now, I think, who can credibly play that role is Lorna. And that's just so obvious. <laughs> it's just so uninteresting to have the woman who's on the ship for no reason anyone can explain <laughs> be the, the sort of moral voice in in his head i just i just don't like that so i think that the role that brace was playing if that falls to lorna's shoulders as i suspect it will is that's just going to be a much less interesting treatment for that very necessary voice um in in the cast and then the other one was the fact that and maybe it's just because i really like him so the chemist at the very end is super badly burned badly burned to the point where you have to assume that he's going to be severely disfigured um and the reason this bothers me is because he's the only funny character in the show. And I don't see how you have a funny disfigured guy without it being super uncomfortable. I don't, I don't know if, if you, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm questioning whether he's going to survive at all. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the shipload of survivors at the end there featured a lot of injured people. Um, the, that whole last, bit did sort of have the feeling of the writers tying off a bunch of loose ends that they didn't want to have to deal with anymore. Mm. Um, and so that was my feeling with that character is that he's maybe not going to survive the journey and, uh, and they're tying off loose ends. It was the same thing with the, the, the guy dying his flags who turned out at the end to be a traitor to the Americans or something. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and he was executed. That seemed super to come out. Of, like, I'm telling you, I don't think that they could get any of these actors to come back for season two. It's the only explanation. <laughs> This is a good opportunity for me to plug uh, one of my favorite characters who we haven't really talked about, who is Atticus, the yeah, yeah, he's doc, good. that guy with the tattoo on his head. Al Capone! Um, who, yeah. yeah who, I, who I think is a really funny person and, and who I hope we get to see more of. 
Um, and uh, so yes, maybe he'll be the he'll be the fill in comic relief. Somebody's got to do it because otherwise, I mean, this is this is a dark show. It's a dreary show. And it's a muddy show, and that's all great. I like that, but you do, you do need to have that wit in there. Um, and it, they, I think that the, the character of the chemist did a really good job of that because it was exactly the right type of wit to work within this framework. I, I think a lot of sort of more obvious forms of humor would stand out and seem, I don't know, they'd be a little bit like the grave digger in Hamlet, wouldn't they? I mean, I think we all agree, right, that in the last episode or so, a lot of characters came to abrupt endings that we, that we didn't find very satisfying. But yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious, Aaron. I mean, you you, you want you were you wanted to do this panel, right? Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about with the show in terms of like why you think people should watch it? I guess what I what I like about the show. I mean, it's funny because one of the things that I, that I tend to appreciate as, as a reader and that I tend to go for as a writer, I'm very much a less is more kind of person. Um, and I don't think less is more is one of the driving philosophies of this show. Um, it's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of excess and there are moments where it's just too much. And there was at least one moment in every episode that I was either laughing or kind of rolling my eyes thinking, okay, that's over the top. It's a little bit too much. It's a little bit, but it does fill a role for me that, that is kind of missing in the shows that, that I'm watching right now, where it is just beautifully atmospheric. It is so moody um, and moody in the best sense of the word, where it's just, it, it's being transported to this other place. It is, I don't know what it costs to shoot this show, but the the details are just beautifully rendered. It, it it's it really is completely um, escapism. It transports you to this other place, and it does. I think it's more successful than some other shows that I've seen that are trying to achieve that. Um, you know, I for example, I watched the first couple of episodes of American Gods, and I'm thinking if you haven't read the book, this is probably just too much. What the fuckery. Like, I, I think it would be very, very difficult to understand what was going on to the point where you get frustrated and, and turn it off. I, I'm enjoying it enough because I have read the book. Um, but I bring that up because I think I think Taboo does a really good job of keeping you questioning and, and frustrated up to the point where it's um, it's like it's like a thrill ride. It's a good type of frustration without taking you over the edge where you're just like, oh, I, I just don't understand what's going on. I can't, it I can't it, follow this. Keeps it below a five on the what the fuckery scale. <laughs> exactly. It keeps it in a manageable level of what the fuckery. And, and that's great. Um, and I think they do a really good job of that. And it's just, what can I say? It's my jam. It's completely, yeah. it's the type of story that I write. It's the type of story that I read. So it's the type of story I want to watch. Yeah, it's definitely immersive. Um, the one other show that comes to my mind that I've been watching uh, that kind of even approaches the same um, level of immersion is The Last Kingdom, um, based on the Bernard Cornwall book, uh, just in terms of historical detail. And, and even if it's not historically accurate, capturing the feel of you know 8th century um, Britain uh, with the, the invading Danes and the Warring Kingdoms. Um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed that one a lot. What's that For, one? The second season is on Netflix. So I imagine mm -hmm. at this point, both seasons are on Netflix. It was originally on, on BBC America. Okay. Um, and you know, interestingly enough, it has some of the same kind of problematic um, you know, issues with women characters and sexual violence and... and and that kind of thing. And, and, and the moments where you're going, what are, what are we doing here? Why are we riding back to Wessex after we've been to Northumbria and, and back three or four times, which realistically <laughs> would take a couple of weeks and why are we sure. doing it in an hour and <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but that's what I, I also appreciate that about taboo that it, it's just, it, it is really committed to its, its atmosphere and it's, it's um, aesthetic. What did you guys make of the exorcism scene? That was very interesting, wasn't it? Um, I think that was one of those moments Aaron was talking about that's just you're either kind of laughing or roll, rolling your eyes, but either way, you're really glad that they did it. 
I would like to understand the role that Zilpha's breasts played in the exorcism because <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there was a lot of boob grabbing going yes. on there and like to <laughs> just almost ridiculous degree. <laughs> yeah, I hated that scene. I felt it was really awful, like it really unpleasant to watch. Gratuitous. I, I felt yeah. like it was intentionally awful and intentionally yeah. gratuitous, and um, which is part of why I'm I'm really mad about what they ended up doing with that character because they were kind of building up all of this stuff and um and now maybe she's a ghost maybe she survived i don't know but it's not as satisfying well but i feel i feel like it was a more realistic portrayal of exorcism than you would see in like the exorcist or something which portrays exorcists as heroes we didn't realize oh no they're, no, they're no, more yeah they're they they, they tie up you know, helpless people probably, you know, very often mentally yeah. ill people and abuse them. They're a tool of the patriarchy. <laughs> That's what that scene got across to me is you want to see the patriarchy in action. This is it right here. Yeah. And, and that again, to, not to be a dead horse, but flog a dead horse, but the, this would have been better for me had it been juxtaposed with a more empowering narrative somewhere. So, I mean, that episode for me was the one where I almost got off the bus because first Zilpha is basically psychically raped by her brother, following which she Mm -hmm. is actually raped by her husband, following which she is sexually assaulted and in all ways abused by the priest and her husband during an exorcism. And she's just abused and abused and abused. And, you know, it, it... and that that was something, if not quite the the exact way it went down for a lot of women of the time, certainly a, a tremendous amount of abuse. And so having that in there would have worked for me a lot better as a commentary on the patriarchy, were it not the only type of portrayal that we see. That was remarkably inarticulate. What I'm trying to say is <laughs> no, no. Uh, it doesn't work as a commentary if if it stands alone. It has to be juxtaposed with something. It was too, um, I'm not thinking of the right word, voyeuristic. It was too voyeuristic exactly. to be a good commentary. Yeah, I guess. It was too voyeuristic. Or and too it exploitative. Wasn't, there, there wasn't enough context around it. It just seemed like we were meant to be titillated by it as opposed to... Um, or horrified by it, but not necessarily um, to think about it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. To me, this this that episode really pinged what I hate about Game of Thrones really hard. Um, totally. Which is, you know, it's this, and it's not just because Una Chaplin is in Game of Thrones, as is Jonathan Price. I mean, there's this really heavy, uh, the last couple seasons have been better of Game of Thrones, but this heavy sort of sexual menace and this menace of sexual violence and violence against women um, that is sort of omnipresent and is sort of like one of the cards they just routinely lay out on the table um, as part of their storytelling sleight of hand. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I wish I wish we could have like really smart, really awesome, complicated narratives which didn't do that, which there are. I don't want to say that there aren't, but uh, I wish this one didn't do that. Does FX not have nudity? Like, is that part of their... Because it was occurring to me if this... In some of these scenes, I was like, if this was Game of Thrones, there would have been like 10 topless scenes by now in this episode. I think they have nudity. I think HBO just is hilariously <laughs> over the top with it. Right. Every every episode of of, that, uh, of any show that HBO does, there's an executive who reviews it to make sure it has enough throat slittings and breasts and sends it back for more for editing it. If it's yeah. Not yeah, I'm I'm I mean, that's that's another conversation for another time, but pretty much I have three quarters of my body off the bus on on Game of Thrones and I can't believe I've stuck with this long. It is You all just, lasted longer than I did. <laughs> I, I just I it's just really the worst. <laughs> on on the on the sexual violence front, I just can't deal with it. Uh, I mean, does anyone else, I feel like we're being kind of like negative on, kind of down on Taboo. Does anyone have anything, uh, any other sort of redeeming things about the show they want to <laughs> mention? Yeah, I, I think the fact that we have so much to say about it is the redeeming quality of the show. That for, you know, we, we've laid out many, many faults, but just the fact that there are so many issues and, and there's so much to talk about and so many interesting characters who intersect in so many interesting ways 
gives us a way, you know, it, it gives us an end. There, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on. And I think that's what draws people into the show. I think if, if, if all of this kind of discussion floats your boat, Taboo is definitely a show to watch. No, completely. And, and I mean, I, I mean, I think I've, I've, I've been clear. Um, I completely loved the show. Nothing is perfect. Um, I think it's not possible. The, the fact that, you know, as, as Carrie was saying that you can analyze it to this extent shows that there's a lot of meat on the bones. Um, and, and that in and of itself is, is interesting. I think not everybody, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Not everybody gets excited about a really atmospheric, dark piece um, but if you do and you want something immersive, this is definitely worth checking out. Um, it's not a super fast paced show that I like about it. Um, you spend a lot more time with characters. You spend a lot more time with moods. You spend a lot more time um, sort of hanging ornaments on the Christmas tree in terms of, of, of world building. And I think all of that makes it a really interesting watch. Yeah, agreed. I, I think that. Uh, Aaron, I think earlier you referred to it possibly in the same sentence as escapism and frustrating, mm-hmm. um, which I, I think is, is kind of impressive that it's telling a story that's so complex and, and doing so much. And also while not having that, the kind of like narrative fireworks and, uh, fast moving, very clear plot that a lot of people sort of go to television and st- you know, and cinema for. Uh, so I, I do think it's doing something really amazing, and I'm really happy that it's a show, and I'm, and that this is the kind of moment we're in in television. Um, but we're not in the moment we fully want to be, right? We're we're not in the place where all these problems that we're complaining about are, not, you know, not there anymore. Uh, yeah. So it's 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 there's a lot there's a lot there, and I, and I really love it. But um, and, and maybe season two will uh, will address some of these challenges. It's also, I mean, if you're interested in historical drama, I think one of the things I like best about it is, and this this goes back to something we were talking about right at the beginning, uh, it's taking place in a time that is traditionally romanticized to to a huge extent, and we we are shown the beautiful side, um, and this is to- showing a very different side, a very unvarnished, unflattering view um, of, of that same period, and I hope that carries through into subsequent seasons because. It is dwelling on a period that has been, in some senses, covered to death, and in many other senses, not really covered at all. And particularly if we do make it, uh, well, we're, I guess we're in the Caribbean now, and depending on, on, on where we go next, um, will be places and times that, that we haven't gotten to see on the small screen in any, um, in, in any sort of, at least something with this budget and this complexity and this cast. So... I think it definitely it, it it hits the spot for me, and I think it's a it's a spot that's not often aimed at. Yeah, I mean, I really liked this a lot. I mean, and maybe part of it is that I am not a big consumer of like the the Jane Austen movies or the you know Regency period things or you know these kind of um, historical dramas as much. I really like them, but I'm, it's not it doesn't tend to be something that I you know consume a lot of. But so this struck me as just like interesting and weird and different and. Like I was saying, the duel and the stuff about making the gunpowder, and uh, I was just like, "Oh, this is just it, it. Just it's a show. It just seems to have a, an artistic vision. It's not uh, trying to be a crowd pleaser. You know, you get the feeling like the people who made it, they're like, this is the show we want to make for better or worse, and we're sticking to that. And there was just something sort of weirdly fascinating to me about that. Yeah, and it's it's a very it's a very mature sort of take on it mature is maybe not the the right word but i I think if if i contrast it to something like um penny dreadful for example yeah i was just thinking that yeah this is just such a more more rounded uh adult version and you know what penny dreadful i i liked some of it and it was it was it was a good uh it was a good popcorn sort of take on uh on some some themes that i like but this is just yeah very adult uh fleshed out version of that same kind of, well, I mean, not nearly as supernatural, obviously, but that same <laughs> but, but, kind of the, mood. I guess the mood is that they're going for is similar. Th- th- this feels a lot like Penny Dreadful. I mean, it, it's not, but it almost feels like it could be like the Better Call Saul to Penny Dreadful's <laughs> Breaking Bad. <laughs> you know, I mean, even the intro seems is like virtually identical in terms of its uh, like the music and the, I don't know, the shots and stuff. You didn't think this felt like like a spin, almost like a Penny Dreadful spin off? 
Uh, <gasps> Penny Dreadful drove me bananas, so I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask. I, I didn't see the third season, so that's how yeah, bananas the, it the drove third, me. <laughs> the third season is where the train goes completely off the tracks. Sharks <laughs> it, it are was, thoroughly it was leaning. Sharks it was leaning thoroughly. in the second. <laughs> Listing terribly. Sharks are are certainly jumped. <laughs> um, early and often in season three. But I mean, I kind of see what you're saying, Dave, it, in, the, in the sense that Penny Dreadful is like, um, much like Breaking Bad, there, there's the difference between Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, or there's lots of differences. But one of the key differences is the pace of the plot. Um, going back to something I was saying before, Jonathan Banks can go entire episodes where I'm not sure he says anything, like literally nothing. He has an enormous amount of screen time in total silence. Um, it's a slow burn plot. And so from that perspective, I, I kind of see the juxtaposition. Um, but but Penny Dreadful is, is very two dimensional in comparison to this rich world. Uh, Sam, what do you think? I don't watch Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad. So <laughs> I uh, did sure you watch did you watch Penny Dreadful? Shows. I watched one very good episode. I watch a lot of television and I just I never get around to watching all the shows I want to watch. So uh, I. I, I do think that this is a very sort of interesting, mature, sophisticated um, look at a time that it's easy to romanticize. I, I, I feel like so much sort of so many period pieces set in London don't really get into the fact that the Thames was basically the sewer, you know, totally. like, like the, the whole city smells like human shit all the time. You know, like this is a show where I just know this everything stinks and the the world is like dirty and gross and. Uh, you know, dirty, gross people are trying to make their way in it the best they can. Wow, can't can't top that. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's your tagline right there. So, what do you guys think is going to happen in season two? I hesitate to make any predictions um, because I know I'm probably wrong, <laughs> but I hope I hope we get a lot of what we've gotten before in terms of interesting, quirky, marginal characters um, in a very atmospheric, you know, it, London, it's really easy to do dark and gritty because there's smog and fog and mist and rain. How they're going to do that on Antigua, if that's where they end up, is a really interesting question. Um, yeah. And so how I, you... I don't know. How do you do dark and gritty in the Caribbean? How do you do dark and gritty in the Caribbean? And how do you, at, on the one hand, accurately portray the culture of the time without mm -hmm. objectifying the culture of the time or and exoticizing making it look, it. exactly yeah. making it yeah. look ridiculously primitive and and all the rest of, that's going to be a very fine line to walk and given you know some of the things that we've set up to this point they are not necessarily the best at walking some of some of those fine lines so it'll be interesting to or at least they haven't been up to this point so it'll be interesting to see how they manage some of those very tricky uh, social and political questions. Well, I mean, one of the reviews I read was pointing out that there's not a single shot in the whole show that takes place on a sunny day. I have not checked <laughs> that, but that sounds right, which well, is obviously that London. would be a <laughs> well, we, right, but that would be a challenge to carry that over to Antigua, right? So, which I, is why I suspect they're not going to stay in Antigua for very long. I suspect that they'll be out into the North American wilderness. Um, right, and that's. I would love to see how much they're able to bring in American history, American, um, you know, early American history uh, at that point. Um, Cause it's very interesting. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on. They haven't really done much with actual historical figures. So I don't know if that's a thing that might happen, mm -hmm. uh, but it would be interesting if they did. Oh, that's, he wanted to meet Thomas Jefferson, didn't he? Yeah. At some yeah. Point? And, and also, and also the, the president. Well, I mean, if you're going to do not a sunny day, the, the, the Pacific Northwest is a, the perfect yeah. spot Absolutely, to, yeah. to set your show. Yeah. I keep feeling like we got to end up at Niska Sound at some point. Yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's where they're going. Yeah, to me, the real challenge is, you know, this show did such a great job of he, he had such a great antagonist in the East India Company, and he had such a great political context in which to function in terms of how skillfully he could play the crown and the company off against each other. Um, and those are both gone now. Uh, you know, I, the East India Company is big. I know it hasn't been destroyed, but um, wherever he's going, it's going to be a really different political landscape. And so you know, the question of what does he really want? What is he, where is he going? What does he want? Um, it's going to be so, so different now. Um, and, and I feel like that's where the, sh the show is going to sort of 
falter or fly. I think I heard that, that, that they had it planned out as a three-season story. So the first season is in London, and then who knows what the next two will be. I heard some suggestions that they might, for season two, it might be like Oregon Trail from Hell kind of thing, where they're uh, <laughs> you know crossing over to the West Coast. Um, oh, and then yeah, the third... except this is, this is right when Lewis and Clark are doing their thing, though. So it's way, way before even the Oregon Trail. So that'll be really interesting uh, to see how they would manage something like that. They'd have to go... Wouldn't they go around the Cape? I mean, yeah. are they going to do it by sea? I would. I mean, anyway, or, you know, <laughs> historical accuracy not being a thing. Maybe they end up on the Lewis and Clark expedition. I don't know. <laughs> that would. That, that sounds like something I would do. I don't think the show <laughs> would actually do that. Hmm. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, any other uh, any final thoughts? How about Sam? Uh, any final thoughts about Taboo? No, just that I really, I really love it. I'm really excited to see to see what's going to happen. Um, can anyone remind me what happened to Godfrey? Did he die in the sort of general slaughter at the end? No, of, uh, no, he's he's on the boat, and there is a a an implication right, that he is planning right. on living as a woman when he um, reaches the colonies. Oh, um, I missed he, that. Well, he's he's wearing his he's cross dressed um, right at the right. end. He's you know in the Molly House he's uh, he's cross dressing, and he's still wearing his his you know female outfit he's wearing that big gown with the powdered wig and everything when he ends up on the ship and um i i kind of got a little bit of a subtext there that he is he is planning on living as a woman um so i'm very interested to see what they do with that as well yeah i hold out hope that that is the the love mm -hmm. that that tom hardy needs to sort of <laughs> you know, get, his, get his shit together and uh find happiness yeah i hold out hope that 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 there is some very satisfying meta arc that that we've only got a, a small glimpse of up to this point, because really, um, as I was saying before, I still have no clue what is driving this guy. I sort of aspects of it, you know, a desire to be to be nobody's man but his own, a desire for revenge against the East India Company, a desire for redemption. Uh, a desire for truth about the, the fate of his mother and his father. And was, was this a love story? Was this a purely a, a transaction? What was all of that? But at the end of the day, he's, he seems to be putting together something enormously complex that we, we haven't really seen and we don't really understand. Um, and so I, what I'm really waiting for is that aha moment where you see all these little breadcrumbs that have been a mystery to you up to this point, how they all sort of come together. Um, and, and I really hope that they, that they deal with it as skillfully in season two as they did in season one, but that also they, they don't sort of leave us dangling um, quite as much in the sense that I don't know if we can make it through an entire second season and still at the end of it have no idea what what, <laughs> what his game plan is. Yeah. I think that would be a lot to ask of viewers. So hopefully we reach the something approximating an aha moment um, around t at least toward the halfway mark of season two. That'd be pretty funny if the last episode of season three, you find out what his motivation was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it would be unconventional, uh, and they do seem to want to be unconventional on this show. All right, so I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Carrie Vaughn, Aaron Lindsay, and Sam J. Miller. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And that was our panel. So a big thanks again to Carrie Vaughn, Aaron Lindsay, and Sam J. Miller for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to William Alvarez and Playwrights Haven, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. 
Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.